Hey everybody, welcome back to Direct Focus. We're continuing our journey through the directorial career of the amazing Steven Spielberg. The last couple weeks brought us on an emotional and dramatic journey with The Color Purple and then Empire of the Sun, both phenomenal movies. This week, we're back to the fun, back to the adventure, and back with an old friend in Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. We're about to complete a great quest, the Holy Grail, Dr. Jones. Oh, rats. Oh. This is it. Look, the shield is the second marker. We found it. Indiana Jones is on the quest of a lifetime. Oh. Oh. But for some adventures, one Jones is not enough. Dad? Junior? Don't call me that, please. Follow me! I know the way! Ah! A race across three continents. And in this sort of race, there's no silver medal for finishing second. Hang on, Dad! We're going in! Into the homeland of the enemy. Nazis. I hate these guys. Our situation has not improved. In his search for the Holy Grail. How dare you kiss me? Are you crazy? Don't go between them! Go between them! Are you crazy? Where's my father? In the belly of that steel beast. Dad! Junior! You call this archaeology? The quest for the grail is not archaeology. It's a race against evil. Germany has declared war on the Jones boys. Those people are trying to kill us. I know, Dad! It's a new experience for me happens to me all the time. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Have the adventure of your life, keeping up with the Joneses. Indiana Jones episodes we've done, you'll know that George Lucas told Steven Spielberg that he had ideas for a whole trilogy. Also, if you recall, that was a lie. The third Indiana Jones movie almost didn't happen. After some dramatic movies, as I just mentioned, Spielberg was sitting around and thinking about the critical and public reactions to the incredibly dark tone of Temple of Doom. He decided to fulfill his promise of three movies to both George Lucas and to the fans. He said that the movie that would eventually become The Last Crusade was something of an apology for Temple of Doom. I wonder what we're going to get after the Crystal Skull. Lucas's original idea for the plot was that Indy would be stuck in a haunted mansion. Not only is that in itself cringeworthy, but Spielberg had just finished making Poltergeist and wanted to do something different. Chris Columbus, who was well known for kid-friendly adventure movies, did a couple drafts of the script that sound just awful. Indie fighting ghosts? 200-year-old pygmies? Cyborg Nazis? Spiritual monkey kings? Make it stop. Luckily, Spielberg wasn't so enthused with these versions either. He wanted to bring in Henry Jones Sr., Indy's father. Lucas was skeptical on having too many plot points, but Spielberg insisted. As we've covered, the father-son relationship is a massive driving force for Spielberg's movies. Menno Maez, and I hope I'm saying that name right, who worked with Spielberg on his previous two dramatic movies gave the script a couple tries as well. He's had love affairs with a nun, demon battles, and a literal stairway to heaven. Not quite as painful as the Columbus concepts, but not great. The next writer brought in was Jeffrey Bohm. Bohm's resume boasts The Dead Zone, Inner Space, The Lost Boys, and The Lethal Weapon movies. Bohm and Lucas worked very closely together and finally came up with a draft that was pretty similar to the final product. The comedy was ramped up in later versions and the prologue was added. Oddly enough, many of the comedic suggestions came from Sean Connery. As a kid, I always loved the prologue. Fleshing out the story of our hero in a mini-movie was a very cool concept to me. River Phoenix, who played the young Indy, thought it made more sense to model his performance after Harrison Ford, the man, rather than Indiana Jones, the character. Phoenix and Ford had previously worked together as an on-screen father and son in 1986's The Mosquito Coast. Prologue features Indiana Jones as a scout to pay tribute to Spielberg's own fond childhood memories of the Boy Scouts. Ford says The Mosquito Coast is still one of his favorite movies, and he was the one to suggest Phoenix for the role. Once again, calling back to past episodes of Direct Focus, you'll remember that Indiana Jones was Spielberg and Lucas's version of James Bond. They really swung for the fences in this movie. The Last Crusade stars a former Bond, a former Bond ally, a former Bond girl, 
two former Bond CEOs, three former Bond villains, and a nightclub owner from one of the Bond films. Nine former Bond actors in all. Another big movie connection is actor Michael Sheard. Sheard is uncredited as his brief appearance as Adolf Hitler. He also played Admiral Ozzel in The Empire Strikes Back. It's a bit of an off-topic, but Sheard portrayed Hitler on screen a total of four times. Not sure that's the kind of typecasting I'd want to get behind. We all know Spielberg has strong ties to the Holocaust both on and off screen. Portraying Nazis as villains is a good move, but not something he took lightly. In the book-burning scene at the Nazi rally, Spielberg had the actors cross their fingers behind their backs as they did the Nazi salute. It's fascinating to know that every last uniform in that scene was truly authentic. The uniforms were found in Germany, unused, and the costume designer got his hands on the whole collection. There's a big laugh toward the end of the movie when Indiana's friends get a look behind the curtain. Henry Jones Sr. lets them know that Indiana was actually the dog's name. There's a dog in the prologue, an Alaskan Malamute. While this is not the exact same Malamute that George Lucas owned, George Lucas did, in fact, own an Alaskan Malamute when he was making Star Wars. That dog's name was, you guessed it, Indiana. There's another famous animal in this movie as well. At the end, when Indy's riding a horse, that same horse was ridden by Sylvester Stallone in Rambo 3. All four horses shown at the end of The Last Crusade were on loan from the King of Jordan. A movie that was only half-jokingly made out of obligation to a friend and to fans became Spielberg's favorite of the indie movies. This holds a special place for me as well, and is one of the few movies I had on VHS as a kid and rewatched until the tape wore out. The movie would go on to score 22 nominations and win 8 awards. One of those awards was an Oscar. The movie was made with a relatively modest budget of $48 million, which really shows what you can do with ingenuity and talent. It would gross just shy of $200 million in the U.S. and nearly half a billion dollars worldwide. With the recently passed Memorial Day being the 30th anniversary of this movie's debut, it was a whole lot of fun to revisit this action-adventure classic. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe to our channel. Also remember to listen to Sub Wizard Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Check out SubWizardPodcast.com for reviews, recommendations, merchandise, and more. We love hearing feedback, so leave something in the comments or drop us a line on social media. All of our accounts can be found after the video. Next time we'll be covering one of the few Spielberg films I haven't seen, 1989's Always.